series, Educating Through a Pandemic. Uh, my name is Brett Hollum, and I'm the Chief Philanthropy Officer here at Bananal Institute, and want to say thank you for joining us today from wherever you may be for this both uh, important and exceedingly timely conversation that will explore the challenges that come while educating through a pandemic. Uh, when the severity of the COVID-19 pandemic became clear earlier this year, schools needed to close their doors practically overnight. Educators worked as quickly as possible to transition lessons in order to accommodate distance learning. They soon found themselves facing one expected challenge after another. And as a parent of three children myself, that became evident quite quickly. Despite many unknowns and much stress, Teachers everywhere continue to dedicate themselves to their Hello. students and are working hard to craft meaningful and engaging um, learning experiences. Today's presentation brings to the forefront VAI's experience and insights into what works and what does, doesn't in a distance learning environment. Today, we're joined by uh, VAI's Chief Education Officer, Tara Tarango as well as a group of educators who are working daily in the unique conditions created by the pandemic. Tara is the Director and Chief Education Officer of Van Andel Institute for Education. Uh, she is also an accomplished executive in the education industry with more than 15 years of experience in educational publishing and services. At the Institute, Tara oversees the education team and its efforts to improve science and inquiry-based instruction in K through 12 education. She and her team provide innovative science programs for students and world-class professional development for educators, which has been now updated to support those working in a multitude of learning environments due to the COVID-19. Uh, before I turn it over to our panel of ex experts and panelists, uh, I do wanna let you know a few housekeeping rules. If you can, uh, feel free to leave your camera turned on, uh, but if you can mute yourself, that would be helpful. We're in a Zoom format so that we can uh, create this opportunity to be as engaging as possible. So if you have questions, uh, you can get those uh, brought forward in a couple of different ways. One, you can put them up through the chat uh, feature. Uh, we'll monitor those and make sure that they get asked towards the end of the program. Uh, otherwise, there'll be a time at the end of the program for an open forum for you to ask whatever questions as, as you wish. Uh, Tara will help us uh, con con uh, conduct that open forum uh, but for now, please join me in welcoming Tara Tarango, who will then introduce our educator speakers for today. Tara. Hi, everybody. I'm Tara Tarango. Thank you, Brett, for that um, introduction. And thank you all for, for coming and coming as it is, right, onto your screen to, to see um, what some educators have to say about what it's like to educate during a pandemic. Um, I think it really is um, a testament to you all who are here that you care enough about this topic to hear from the people it really affects the most directly. Um, I think that's the best way to find out what it's like is actually to ask those folks who are doing it. So I'm going to share my screen here to start and just give you a little bit of um, context of what it's been like for educators to, um, to do this, to teach during a pandemic. So one second as I find it. Here we go. Pull it over from the other screen. Are you able to see my um, my screen? Got a thumbs up. All right. Um, so I'll share a little bit about what it's been like from a you know some national surveys that have been put out, and then like I said, we'll spend the bulk of our time with our teacher panel, so you can hear from them directly. And as Brett said, as we go along, if you have questions, throw them into the chat. And as we're doing that panel discussion, we'll make sure we um, can address those. So thank you again for joining us. I also wanted to say the main point of this really is like I said, for you to understand directly from teachers what it's like, um, whether you're a parent trying to support um, your own students during this time or whether you're a community member trying to support your local schools or whether you're just curious about what this is like. Hopefully this gives you some insights into a topic that everyone seems to have an opinion about, um, but maybe not necessarily hearing from those that are directly involved. So that's our goal here today. So I wanted to kind of take us back to that February through June um, time period. I affectionately call this the shut the front door period, right? Both literally and figuratively, it was like, what just happened? All the doors shut. And it's important to remember, this was um, global, right? So you can see in this chart here, the number of weeks that schools were closed. Um, you know, some were closed between, most of them were between 12 to 16 weeks there. Um, and in this time, this was really, really tough because, you know, teachers had no preparation for this whatsoever. So a few stats there on the side, 
59% of teachers reported that they had been able to contact all or nearly all of their students. So, you know, that's not a lot, right? Just under 60% were able to contact their students. That means 40% weren't even able to contact them. And only 17% indicated that they were not providing, um, that they were providing any feedback on students' work. 17% said they were not. So not very many people, um, some of those people didn't get to give that sort of feedback. It was just really, really tough. Then you had the summer to sort of prep for what fall might look like. Although I have to say, you know, when we shut down and say March or April, shut our doors, we took some, some bets within our little office about when we might go back. And I think June, the end of June was the latest one at that point. So it really wasn't necessarily in our collective consciousness that we might not even be coming back in fall. Um, but still a lot of teachers did prepare for that. And so this just kind of is a snapshot into how students um, are learning this fall. So you can see, you know, fully in person um, for all schools, 20%, only 20% were fully in person versus 47% some sort of hybrid and 33% were fully remote as we opened schools. And you can see that there's some differences in that when you look at our highest poverty schools or highest minority schools, right? Those you had um, even more that were fully remote in those particular environments. So what did that mean for teachers at that stage? 66% um, of them reported the majority of their students were less prepared to participate in grade level work than in a regular school year. 27% indicated the majority of students were significantly less prepared than the prior year. And many teachers reported assigning letter grades during the fall, which was, or 59% did, which was nearly double what it was in spring, right? So, but there's still, that's not very many for doing kind of that formal assessment. And then of those doing that, most of that was in secondary, um, only 41% in elementary. And then finally, 90% of teachers had converted nearly all of their curriculum content um, or covered nearly all their content that they normally would have covered. So less than 20% were covering as much as they would have normally covered. So bottom line between all those stats and numbers is, you know, it's tough to imagine that as much of the content was getting across to the kids during this time period. All right, and then how teachers are coping, right? So this, I won't go through all this, this chart with you, but suffice it to say, particularly those teachers who are in fully remote environments are reporting that they need a lot of help. They needed strategies to catch up those students who weren't at grade level. You know, they needed all sorts of different supports, right? Access to high-speed internet from their home, all, all sorts of things were needed. Um, lots of different gaps in terms of what um, teachers felt like they needed. But I think also important to that is this was a survey that was done in October. And at that point, and keep in mind, October is usually a time when teachers are at their happiest. You know, the school has just started, they finally got their sea legs under them and they're excited about all that they planned for this year. Yet this October, 80% of teachers said feelings of burnout were a moderate or major concern. So burnout already happening very beginning of the school year. Um, but yet they're working more hours than they were pre-pandemic, 57% said that. Um, principals reporting major substitute shortages. So, you know, majority of principals are finding that. And then 40% of fully remote teachers have majority or very major or very major need for strategies to keep students engaged and catch up to grade level. And that's especially high in our highest poverty and highest minority schools. So that need to engage and catch kids up is definitely prevalent. So that was October. Um, this is a Michigan only one, just wanted to kind of share in November, a little bit more recent, how effective do Michigan educators think virtual learning has been for students? This is, you know, pretty mixed, I would say almost, you know, pretty equal, 53% uh, saying it's been effective, and then um, 41, 13 um, saying not effective. And 68% of Michigan educators think it's unlikely that school be able to open for in-person in January, as we're a little bit, that was in November, but as we're a little bit closer to January, that's seeming more and more likely here in Michigan. And 84% of Michigan educators are very or somewhat concerned about the safety of reopening for in-person learning. So, you know, that's definitely a large percent of teachers who have that as a concern for themselves and their students. And then I'll finally bring you to December where we are right now, just to kind of give you, I think this is sort of a kind of interesting looking map. Um, this is um, showing, from a sort of policy or statute standpoint where there are full closures in effect. Um, so you can see there's a partial closure in effect for Michigan right now with high schools um, being in remote only. But this kind of gives you a sense of, you know, majority of the country, there's no order in effect, but there are um, some that have partial closures in effect, full closures in effect, or that have been ordered open, the blue ones here. So hopefully, like I said, it's not necessarily a commentary, good or bad, but I wanted to give you a sense of 
um, you know, what is happening out there from, you know, the moment this sort of started to now and how that's evolved and give you a little bit of a glimpse of what the Van Andel Institute is doing about it. Um, so we have student programs and teacher programs. Um, I won't go through the details of all of them. You can all learn more about those at vaei.org. But essentially, just like teachers around the country, we've made those virtual. So our summer camps, after school programs, high school journal club, which one of our panelists is participating in with her students, um, and even a virtual Halloween science spectacular, which was a fun public event that kids could come on to and um, learn a little science while they had some spooktacular fun. And then teacher programs. So obviously the content of our teacher professional development has switched to a lot of supporting teachers in remote learning environments, um, offering sort of flexible professional development hours, making you know our project-based learning units that we do virtual, um, and then also offering just several virtual projects that can be done in a remote environment. And the biggest thing for us, and we'll see what our panel has to say about this, but um, is really making sure that that learning is still hands-on. So I kind of chose this picture. You can see the kids are still, you know, extracting their DNA and making, you know, doing some science at home, thinking and acting like scientists, which I think is really important and not always easy for, um, for teachers to accommodate, but something that we found really, really successful. All right, so like I said, give you a little bit of context. Um, hopefully that just, you know, gives you some stats to um, wrap your head around a little bit. But like I said, let's hear from our panel themselves. And I'm gonna have them introduce themselves, but I did wanna let you know, we have two elementary school teachers, um, two high school teachers and one middle school teacher. They're hailing from all over Michigan and one from Colorado. Um, so with that said, like I said, if you wanna learn more about us, you can find us all over the place. <laughs> VA, we are VAEI for Facebook and Twitter. Um, but I will stop sharing my screen now. If I can figure that out. Where is that going? Share screen. Oh, maybe it stopped it for me. You did. <laughs> all right, so we're back. Um, so I will call on some folks from our panel to answer these first few questions. I think you might like to hear from everybody. So first, I'm just going to have them introduce themselves, you know, what's your name, where it is you teach or what you teach, um, and then just roughly how you're affiliated with VAI, how you came to be on this call, if you wouldn't mind. So just kind of introduce yourselves. Um, let's start with elementary. Let's go with Munira. Well, good afternoon. Um, my name is Munira Spiller. Um, I teach first grade at Detroit Enterprise Academy um, in Detroit, Michigan. Um, I'm associated with VAI because I actually took um, a few professional development trainings um, in October with you all. Excellent. Welcome, Nira. And we'll keep going elementary. How about Paul? Afternoon, everyone. I'm Paul Yenny. I'm a fifth grade teacher at Steele Elementary in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And two years ago, Tara found me on Twitter and asked me if I would like to pilot a project. And so I got to be the first to teach the high volt, high energy project that we did. And it was a blast. And I've just stayed connected with them on Twitter. Great, great. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. How about Matt, our middle school representative? Hi, yeah, my name is uh, Matthew Brady. I'm a uh, middle school teacher. I teach electives, which is a variety of subjects such as um, STEM careers, technology. Um, I teach at Swan Valley Middle School, which is in Saginaw, Michigan. And I taught um, five years of elementary in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I'm affiliated with the VAI because I partnered with uh, Randy Skagardis, hopefully I said his name right. Um, and we did a virtual field trip for my eighth graders where I worked with him and a couple of his uh, lead professors. And we did a virtual CSI, which uh, went very well. That was um, about a week before the shutdown. Excellent. Second All right, we're, we're, um, <laughs> we're graduating to high school now, Marcella. Marcella Weldon. I um, teach science at Grand Haven High School, earth science, physics, and it looks like some chem second semester. And I am affiliated with VAEI because back in 2013, um, our high school science department was went to the immersion training at the Van Andel um, offices in Grand Rapids. And we were, we're using a lot of the, the process of Van Andel's science program. And I trained there with Dawn McCotter, who is now an employee there, and we're still friends now that she's working at the Bain Andel. Very nice. And then the last but not least on our panel is Heather. Hello, I'm Heather DeYoung, and I teach at Lowell High School. 
Um, this is my 30th year, so I'm a new teacher this year in this environment. And I teach uh, biology, AP biology, and I have a science research class that's been a real challenge to try to orchestrate remotely. And I am affiliated with the Van Andel Institute uh, because I've done high school journal club that uh, Tara had mentioned. I actually did that today virtually with my students. I've done that for several years. And then I also was fortunate enough to be part of the partners in science uh, that the Van Andel Institute offered. And I got to spend two summers working under a researcher and a former student of mine at the Van Andel Institute, which was an amazing experience. Very cool. Well, thank you for introducing yourselves and welcome again to our panel. Um, I do want to tell you guys watching just to take a little bit of the burden off of our panel, you know, just like, you know, no few people can represent the perspectives of an entire group. You know, these folks are here to speak to their perspectives, not necessarily the entire teaching profession. Um, and also, I kind of mentioned this to them sort of laughingly, but teachers are very comfortable in teaching and talking to their students, but not always so comfortable talking to adults. So I really appreciate their time in this really um, busy time and their, um, their willingness to talk to you guys. So my first question, let's dive right into what I think most of you might wanna know is um, what are your biggest challenges that are facing you right now in the situation that you currently find yourself in with your classroom? Um, so let's, this time, let's start with Paul. Thanks. Um... I was thinking about this question today and thinking about the challenges that I feel now and realizing that the challenges I feel right now are not the challenges I felt a month ago. So my district is um, hybrid high flex, meaning that we're doing in person and online at the same time. But right now we are fully remote because of, because of spike, spiking numbers in our community. And so what I realized is the biggest challenge really is having these two models that we keep flipping back and forth between. And so I'm having some big challenges online right now that I didn't have when I was teaching in person, but I also had some huge challenges teaching in person um, because I had to incorporate online kids. And so it's, it's at a point where you feel like you get really into a rhythm and then you snap back to a completely different set of circumstances. And so I think the biggest challenge is flipping back and forth and not knowing when those are gonna occur. Um, my class has been quarantined already. And so we, my kids and I knew from experience that, hey, you might leave school one day and then you're not coming back to school for another two weeks and you won't know until you get that phone call. And so I think that uncertainty has been the biggest challenge as well as the juggling online kids and in person in those different modes. And then being online and not having that relationship piece, which is why a lot of us went into teaching in the first place. And that energy of a room full of kids um, that's kind of lost when it's just a wall of digital faces, so. That makes a lot of sense. I think uncertainty might be the word of 2020. <laughs> um, how about uh, Munira, how about you? biggest challenges that are facing you right now? Okay, um, personally, I would say just physically very tired um, and just worn down, like even just body aches. I'm used, I teach six-year-olds, so I'm used to walking around. I never sit at my desk. Now I'm confined to a couch all day. Um, I don't have a desk, you know, in my house. So my back hurt, my eyes hurt. Um, I'm very grateful for a principal who listens to me. Um, I actually, you know, share some concerns and she bought me some blue light glasses. I can now work on the computer, but that was a solution to a real life problem. Like I already wear glasses and now my eyes are strained. Um, I think as far as my students and the parents, just consistency across the board, consistency to showing up to class every day, consistency of completing all of the work and just contacting parents, that's a struggle. I feel like a stalker sometimes. Um, I'm emailing you, I'm calling you, I'm calling your emergency contacts and it's really hard um, to get in contact, but some parents being very honest, I can't afford to pay my, my internet bill this month, my phone is cut off. So just a lot of challenges that everybody is facing um, and how it just all connects, it, it all connects. Um, and also lastly, just parents taking this serious, this is school. 
even though it is through a computer, this is school and this is what it is. Um, and this isn't optional. Really, really good. Very real. I appreciate that. Um, how about Heather? What about you? What are the challenges you're facing? I think uh, definitely the challenges are keeping students engaged and motivated, uh, providing, you know, meaningful activities for them while they're at home. I feel, you know, especially with science, students love science, they love the hands on aspect of it. And when you do virtual labs, it's not the same. So it's, it's really difficult to, again, as I think, uh, others have said to keep these kids engaged and motivated and to keep school first. I mean, it, it's still important, even if they're at home and to just show up every day and do their work and do their best and for their parents to support them. Uh, that's, that's really the challenges for all of us. Yeah, makes sense. How about you, Marcella? It's a lot of the same things everyone else has been saying. Um, I think my word when I was thinking about it, like Paul was saying, mine was the unknown, just that never knowing what tomorrow brings um, and how many kids will be in a classroom tomorrow. Um, I had a colleague that one day she had six students. The other 24 were virtual just before we um, left for re fully remote. And now that we're fully remote, it's the unknown of like, it's weird things pop up, which cause like, we need to have a, a meeting in either department or staff meeting and it's easier virtual, but that takes away from the time that is like ethereal. Like the idea of enough time to get anything done is impossible. Mm -hmm. And then as Heather was saying, finding something the kids are even slightly interested in, in a topic that would be so much fun to have a discussion and throw something around in and physics to then have them do it on a computer is so much harder. And it takes a lot of brain power that is already exhausted to then find a way for them to do something so that they're engaged in the content at all besides reading and that's not engaging when they're doing it alone at home yeah yeah it's really tough I appreciate all of your honesty all right Matt I'll take this one to you as well what challenges do you face um, so I, I, I uh, reiterate a lot of the others' uh, opinions. Um, one of the biggest ones for me is um, creating relationships and personal connections with kids. You know, when you're in school, it's so much easier to get to know a kid and have conversations about, you know, sports and other things that are going on outside of school. Um, so doing that virtually, you know, it, it's really tough. And um, as teachers, we don't teach for the money. We teach for the, the kids and building relationships and making memories. So to not have that... Um, is, is a huge loss in my opinion. Um, and then like um, Ms. Heather said, um, having lack of engagement, you have to be engaging with all of your lessons. And I think um, Robert has an example of one of mine. Um, you just have to put yourself out there and uh, you know, be willing to be embarrassed a little. All right, let's see it. Okay, as you can see, Mateo is wearing a black satin dress for muscular built women with a floral arrangement. This is sold at Old Navy for $19.95. This is a great one. As you can see, my Lito is wearing a cotton uh, Christmas sweater with nice khakis. The cotton Christmas sweater prices at $34 at Babies R Us. Hello, everybody. Happy Thursday. I'm home. So, yeah, you kind of get the idea. You have to, uh, that was for a career. I teach careers. So, we were learning about the arts and it was a fashion design project. Um, so, you have to be creative with how you engage and, um, you know, learning just to, to put yourself out there and, and create these daily instructional videos and balancing it with Zoom uh, is something new for all of us. Thanks for that, Matt. And I think, you know, showing that video really kind of goes, shows the links sometimes teachers have to go to to kind of make something engaging and, and the work that that takes, you know. Um, but I also think it's a nice transition because I don't want to leave you with all the doom and gloom of the challenges. I know teachers are also having successes out there. And I think Matt just showed one right there, being able to kind of recreate some content like that. But let's hear from the rest of you. What are some um, successes that you have found or that some of your colleagues have found? Um, maybe we'll take this one to, um, to let's start with Heather. Well, uh, certainly some successes that we've had is I have learned so much new technology. Most of our professional developments this year have been geared towards giving us time to learn new technology. I have at home now, um, I had to get webcams, I have two screens, 
and we have staff science zoom meetings all the time we check in with each other we're on a group chat all the time hey what about this what about that so certainly the collaboration piece has really come to the forefront because i think all of us as educators right now the the community is so willing to share and help each other out and that's really been across the country and all these groups working together, you as the Institute helping us. I mean, we appreciate that so much. If someone's an expert at some something and they can share and help others, that's what's happening right now in the learning community, which is really great. That's really, that's, that's heartening to hear. Um, all right, let's go down to elementary, Munira. What are some successes that you or your colleagues are having? Okay, I took some notes, but um... It's funny, I heard across the board the other teachers are saying that they're struggling with building relationships. I feel like I know this class more than my other classes, my sixth year of teaching. Um, before I start every class, I ask for good news, but it's just a lot of, it's a lot more time I feel like for the kids to talk about what they want to talk about. And because they are at home, I get to see their dog, they're talking about their siblings, they're sharing things that they're doing with their dads, and those are things that I never had time to hear about because it's like work, 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 you know? Um, so that's a positive thing. Like very, I, I always build great relationships with the parents, but it's really cool to learn the students from the students. And I do appreciate that time. Um, I think across the board, my school has just done a great job of engaging parents. We have virtual game nights. Um, we still have club, we have coding club now. We have girl talk, we have guy talk for the older students. Um, and my favorite of all, we had um, a fall fest, a drive-through event. So all of the students got book bags, but it had workbooks, pencils, so materials so that you can be engaged. So we provided the students with everything they needed. So, you know, just take out your whiteboard. So we're still able to engage that way. And for the kids that, again, I teach five-year-olds, but even thinking all the way up to seven, writing is still important. So you still still need still need to um, write because you're not going to type everything. So those are some successes um, that me and my colleagues have had. I like that's such a great example of how nuanced all these topics are. You know, for one teacher, building relationships in this environment is, is a struggle. For another one, that might be something that's successful in this environment. It, it's much more nuanced than I think we might give it credit for as we think of these as a face value. Um, Marcella, how about you? What successes are you having? Definitely some of the same things. Um, like going off what Heather was saying, it's absolutely true that many of our staff have been forced outside their comfort zone because they're like, yeah, I'd love to learn that tool, but I just don't have the time to learn it. Well, now it's kind of, you got to learn it because there's no other way to do it anymore. Um, like, because making a video and being on camera scared the bejesus out of everybody last spring. And now everyone's like, oh yeah, I made another video. I got my screencastify notification that I'm number 10 in our district of 1200, a number of videos I've made. Um, and then the forcing everyone to work tighter together, the communication between us and among us is the most I ever remember in my 15 years of teaching. Like we all are talking constantly, like how I said, it's like emails and all the meetings and then the, the cell phone, the, the chat group, the group chats all day long, because we're all communicating a lot. Um, and with the, I like, I feel like I'm in the middle of the engagement. There's kids that I don't know what they look like. And there's other kids that I know so much about them because we spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time working through the math of physics. And the one-on-one -on -one time I can have with kids is astronomical compared to what I would in a normal classroom setting. Like what Marino was saying, like with the, the time in the classroom is less, but this time my time is different. Yeah. Excellent. All right. And Matt, I know you showed a video. I consider that a success. Did you have another success that you'd like to share? Um, just, yeah, it's kind of some of the same things. Um, but, you know, teachers, uh, the ability to adapt, I think, is, is huge. And, you know, this, this could be the, the future somewhat of teaching. You know, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, I think he's going to pull up another video here. But um, we have to adapt. And, and I think it's really to adapt as well. Let's get cracking. First off, think of your type of party. Then let's take an edit cruise like a safari. Next, click the date and decide what day and month is adequate. adequate. After that, let's find a picture. Save from the internet into your photo mixer. Click the plus sign in the bottom corner. Find your photo and change it like a transformer. Scroll down, let's get, let's change the party title. 
getting guests intrigued is so vital. Paint brush is the key to change the font size and anything. A little bit more, now you're flowing. Probably good, Robert. Down to the <laughs> yeah, so, so that was a, that was a wrap for uh, I teach tech app. So we're talking about pages and, and ways to uh, do a template within pages. But yeah, the ability you know to adapt and, and problem solve and um, you know is something that I think all teachers are, are are figuring out, and hopefully we can apply it towards future teaching. Yeah, definitely adaptation. Probably another one of those words. Um, how about you, Paul? What are some of your successes? Um, we learned really quickly in March that it was not going to work to just take what we were going to do in the classroom and put it online and just do like a, we were doing this, now we're just going to do it online. Um, and what we found really worked the best was giving kids projects that had a lot of inquiry and a lot of choice. Um, and so this year I started the year, we started fully remote. And so I started the year just saying, we're going to be we have a daily math, a daily reading, but then we're gonna, our primary focus is gonna be on a big project and we're just gonna jump from project to project. And I had a really supportive principal who when we came back in person said, I will, let's keep this going and we can keep it going in the hybrid model. And that has been really successful too when we've had those sudden shifts, we really can carry those project-based things back and forth. And when we're in class, what we're really working on is less the content and more of the skills of how do you set goals? How do you self-pace? How do you choose what you want to do? And so that model has been really successful for me and my kids. And I feel like they've started to learn a lot of the skills that, um, that I wish I had been teaching all along, the, the soft skills that, um, that really should be there to put together a, a project and get you self-motivated. Um, so that has been really nice. And also I love my principal. He, his, um, his philosophy explicitly this year has been focus and prioritize on social emotional learning. And so I feel like I have had the blessing to go and create relationships and take time out of what normally would have been academic time to really focus on those relationships. And so while it's been harder in an online setting, the time that I've been given and the time that I've been able to take really has strengthened that relational piece, which has helped with things like attendance and engagement and just having kids willing to work when they're not in the school building. Gotcha. Very helpful. Thank you guys. I don't know, as a as a listener to all of that audience, I mean, I hope that you took away what I did, which was an appreciation for the amount of work it takes to get those successes, you know, whether it was creating those videos or creating those relationships and the time it takes with those one-on-ones or trying these new projects and all of that. Um, it, you know, those successes don't just come easy, right? It's a lot of work involved with that, but it was definitely heartening to hear. So I want to cover a few more topics and we'll just ask maybe a couple panelists to speak on each of these topics so we can get through more and still have time for questions, which I see at least one coming in. Um, so the next one I have is probably one I think, you know, maybe parents want to know most, which is, do you feel that students' education is being negatively impacted by this? You know, honestly, do you feel like it's negatively impacted? Let's um, pick one from elementary and one from high school. Munira, maybe let's start with you. Do you think that students' education is being negatively affected by all of this? Um. Honestly, yes, I do. Um, so my typical day, if we were in person, would have been from 740 to 315 with me teaching roughly about six hours, um, five days a week. So cutting that down to basically I engage and teach live sessions collectively um, for like an hour and a half to two hours. So you're not even learning half of the content I would typically teach if we were in person. Um, so yeah, we can throw that out the door. You're not even learning nearly as much. Um, but also even the retention, you know, um, you just don't have time to repeat and review as much. Um, but because the schedule 
like we don't teach on Wednesday. So the schedule is so choppy. Um, you're not really having opportunities to really remember and retain the information, um, which I'm concerned about. On top of all of the hard work it takes to create these videos and these PowerPoints, um, it's just not at all. You're not even, no, you know, so yes, it negatively impacted and I'm very concerned um, of what the next school year will bring. So that's a tough feeling to know you're working harder than ever, but don't feel like you're necessarily getting the outcomes that, that you have in the past, you know, um, yeah. but I appreciate that honest answer. Let's jump to high school. Um, Marcella, how about you? Do you feel like students are being, um, their education is being negatively impacted? I think it's kind of a yes and a no. Um, content wise for high school science, they're definitely not getting all of the content. Um, but I think they're getting the big takeaways. And, you know, for my earth science class and my physics class, both, they're still getting the, the real life application pieces of how science fits in their life and those things. They're not necessarily getting all the little details, but I don't think they necessarily keep those little details. Mm -hmm. but the yes is they're getting some cool, some amazing skills that like Paul was starting to talk about that they wouldn't have gotten in high school otherwise, or they're getting much earlier. Um, I have some juniors who are just like reflecting right now about how, oh my gosh, this is the freedom of my day that I was going to have when I went to college. And now I know how I've learned through bad mistakes, how to manage my time. And I feel like freshman year of college isn't going to be scary like my brother's was. And I'm not going to fail a class in college because I know how to have all these things and figure out how to make a schedule. And I've had someone there to help me, like from the teachers and peers, and because we're trying to help them learn those management skills because we're not teaching the full day anymore. They don't have a teacher in front of them reminding them, oh, get back on that. Like, oh, yep, you've gotten distracted. They don't have us as their conscience anymore. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, and I think, you know, what you're also seeing is a difference in age groups that you're working with too, you know, so um, I can see that. Huge. It's, yeah. Right. It's a lot easier to get that content across, even maybe it's not all of it in remote with a, the high school setting than, than maybe elementary. Um, another kind of topic that's really big in education right now, and is, is, you know, we've always tried to look at the whole child and it's not just about education, but the idea of social emotional learning. So I'm curious whether you feel students social emotional health is being negatively impacted um, by all that's going on right now. So also, um, let's start with Paul for you on this one. Do you, how do you feel like social emotional health is being affected? Um, I think it's, it's kind of a, a yes and no on the, the harmness, um, the harmfulness of what's going on. Um, on the positive end, I have a former student and I have a student this year who um, really struggle with anxiety and being in a classroom and being with peers and um, the freedom that they've had to be at home and set their own pace has been really helpful. But I think that's a slim minority. I think it's a minority that's really being helped. And a lot of these kids are really learning about themselves. But I think for a lot of kids, um, not being with their friends every day is really hurting them just in feeling as part of a community. Um, and we have, I am lucky enough to work at a relatively high SES school where most of my kids show up, but I still have a lot, I still have a handful of kids that, that are not showing up a lot and that have kind of gotten lost. And I had a conversation with my social worker about a lot of it is just parents are in a place where they're trying to survive and the kid is trying to survive and school is rightfully not a priority in some of these places when you're just trying to get food on the table and trying to figure out how are we gonna make it to next week. Um, and so there is some trauma happening. And I know people at Title I schools in my district where they are lucky to get half of their kids in a meeting at any particular time, just because there are other priorities right now, for better or for worse. And some of those are survival. And some of them are when you get to older and older and older grades, the, well, I don't really have to show up. Why, am I, why would I show up? Um, so I really think we're losing that. And I'm, what I'm also seeing is parent and cultural anxiety is really leaking onto the kids and they're really picking that up. And there's a lot more anxiety. After we came back from our um, quarantine we had every day um, started with someone asking, well, how long are we gonna be here? 
Mm. Um, and me saying, I don't know. Mm. Um, and there was this always just underlying feeling of how long is this cool thing we have in person going to last? Yeah. Um, and so I know that has been a real struggle for my kids. Yeah, that's insightful. Thank you. Um, how about Matt? What do you think about at the middle school level, the social emotional health and how that's being affected, if at all, right now? Yeah, I think at the middle school level, it's um, highly detrimental to the kids. You know, uh, at the middle school, you know, you're going through so many different changes and the situations that arise um, within school, whether it's being at a dance or the sporting events or in class or, you know, maybe you're getting in trouble or you're that you're getting into honor roll. I mean, there's so many new um, things that are happening at the middle school life and with their bodies changing that it's so important for them to experience those situations and figure out how to get through them and you know to not have that and to take one year away is is just it's 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 tough to think about um, and I also I, I think the long lasting effects of some kids are just going to think social isolation is normal and that you know sitting in their room for weeks upon weeks is, is something that is normal to do when that's just really not how the world works. I mean, maybe right now it does, but when a pre pandemic, you know, you've got to be able to have conversations and, and put yourself out there and get out of your comfort zone in order to grow. Yeah, so true. All right, Heather, how about you um, in the high school? Um, what do you think about social emotional health and how that's being affected? I, I think it's definitely negatively affecting the students. In fact, I, you know, I, I asked them, I told them I was going to be doing this panel and would share some of their information and how they're truly feeling. So it comes right from the student's heart. And they're fearful, uh, a lot of them, because we were hybrid, then we're shut down. I've had situations where the whole left side of my room was quarantined. All of a sudden, as Paul said, you come to school and then someone's positive. So your whole room, your whole class um, has to stay home. You don't know how for long. Then you have to you have to service those students while you're still teaching and make them feel like they're not missing out. So the students are fearful and you know the uncertainty as you said Tara of this year and probably into the next it puts a lot of stress on us as teachers parents the community I mean we're all dealing with this and we and I really feel for the students high school students you know most of my a lot of my students are seniors and their senior year all the dreams they had all the dances all the events uh, all the sporting events it's not what they thought their senior year was going to be and it really breaks my heart for them. Oh, that's so true. I know. Oh. Um, it's a side little story. I know my um, daughter was a senior and she broke her foot right before prom. This was the year before COVID. And then, um, so she missed out on all that stuff, but then it was like the next year is realized, you know, the entire school year missed out on all that. She gained quite an appreciation for that. Anyway, um, all right. I want to switch to something maybe more um, positive or action filled. So, what can parents or community members do to support teachers or to support their schools or to support their own kids? Um, so what can parents do during this time? Let's go back to elementary. How about Munir? What can parents do to support their children or community members? Um, but what specifically parents I'm thinking? Okay, for parents, patience. So again, I, I, I work with five and six year olds and I think as adults, you think something as simple as 10 plus 10 equals 20 is very easy. So I hear a lot of parents, you know that, come on, and just reprimanding their, their children for not knowing, but, you know, understanding as a parent the, the stages of development, you know, um, 10 plus 10, that's kind of, you know, that's something big to a, a six-year-old, and that's not something that might have been mastered in kindergarten, but also keep in mind they missed out on maybe three or four months of the last school year. So they already didn't learn everything they would have. So patience um, goes a long way. Um, I think let's learn together. So what is your child learning and how can you extend that beyond the computer? So for example, I'm teaching my students money now. So maybe we can invest in, let's play some board games. How about let's buy Payday or let's buy Monopoly. So how can we connect what you're learning um, in class and let's take this, you know, outside of the classroom, but let's make it real. Um, and I think a last, just some educational games like bingo. My kids, we love bingos, dominoes, just 
find things that we can tangibly connect to what we're learning through the computer. Um, and I just think just creativity. And I also think the last one, um, being engaged with the school or maybe reaching out to school and asking for help. Are there free tutoring opportunities? Because those are opportunities that um, our school has through partnerships, but just making sure you're aware of what's out there because there is a lot of support um, for students and for parents, uh, maybe even food drives, you know, if you need food, are there any free meal pickups? Um, and also just talking to your students about feelings. Every morning we have a morning meeting and the students have to type a sentence. How do you feel today? And you're allowed to feel sad. You're allowed to feel angry um, and creating a safe space for your child um, to express themselves and to feel how they feel. Yeah. Great tangible tips there. Thank you. Oh, let's jump to high school. Marcella, how do you think parents could support their children during this time? I think one of the biggest conversations I've had with parents the most this semester, especially, is just that you're the student's platform, be it the, their Google Classroom work or their stuff in Brightspace, that platform is open to parents. Um, and because they're like, well, I don't know what they're doing. It's like, please take the time, sit down with them at the end of the day, at the beginning of the day, on the weekend, have them show you what they're working on, have them show you how it's been submitted, look at the feedback they're given. Yeah, it's high school and you want to give your student freedom, but this is not the high school they've ever learned how to do before. So they need that extra guidance. They need you to be, you know, the middle school hovering parents again, not the like, hey, you're a high schooler, you know what you're doing. They don't know what they're doing. They have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. All right, I want to make sure we have a little time for some questions at the end. So I'm going to use our last question for the panel that I'll give them. And it's a challenging one. I like to put folks on the spot, but I think it's always fun when we're challenged to really summarize what something is. So I like to do something called the five word challenge. So I'm issuing this to our panelists in five words or less, and I'll spot you a word or two if you really need it. Um, describe being a teacher in 2020. Let's start with you, Matt. Um, so I talked to my kids. So I have a kids one and a teacher one. I hope that's okay. Oh, all right. Yeah. The kids said stressful staring at the screen. That was theirs. Uh, mine was more work, less time with kids. Mm, that was all right. How about you, Paul? What are your five words describing a teacher in 2020? We have a group of us uh, at my school that when we're having conversations, we end our conversations with just three words and we just say, this is hard to recognize that we all are feeling it and that it's valid and it's okay to feel that way. So my three words are, this is hard. Bonus points for even two, you didn't even use two of your words. Bonus points. Um, Marcella, how about you? What are your five words? I think unknown, ever-changing and harder than ever. I think I went to the six. <laughs> okay, that all makes sense. Um, Munira, how about you? Not for the week. <laughs> So true. And Heather, what are your five words? Okay, I have some student responses too. Um, here's the student responses. New but not improved. Unpredictable, disappointing, unknown, still living our best. And mine would be adaptability and perseverance because we're going to make it. Uh, I like that hopeful way to end things. Thank you for that. That's always a fun and, and difficult challenge. Also builds lots of creative and critical thinking with our kids. So I like to do it with them a lot as well. So thank you panelists for answering those questions that we came up with. Hopefully that gave you as an audience some idea of what it's like to teach during a pandemic. Um, so I think we'll go to, I do see some questions in the chat room. So let me see if I can cipher those out for a moment. All right, this looks like a pretty specific question. So um, a question for the panelists. I am an enrichment educator whose program used to go into schools to facilitate in-person workshops. We are now creating digital media to share with classes. My question is, what advice do the panelists have for our program about formatting our materials? What type of digital content is most successful and low stress for teachers to administer? Any of our panelists wanna take a crack at that? What type of digital content is most successful and low stress for teachers to administer? Anybody have anything come into mind? Well, it kind of it kind of depends on what what they're familiar with. Um, in in my school, we have Apple training, and every kid has an iPad. So the digital content that that I feel most familiar with is um, iMovie. And iMovie, I think it's very easy to to plug in a video and do a voiceover and record your voice pretty easy. Um, and you can put cool backgrounds and and whatnot on there. 
Um, so that would be the digital format I have. Um, but if you don't have an Apple product, that could be, you could run into another problem. Excellent. To piggyback on what Matt was saying, I think you have to know the district you're going into. Like for me, it would be anything in the Google space is easier for me. Um, and, and just knowing ahead of time, hey, are you a, a Google school, a Microsoft school, an Apple school? I mean, I think that's part of the challenge too is with collaborating. And when I've tried to collaborate with people across out of my district, it's hard because we're not all using the same platforms and that's rough. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So uh, there's another question here, which I think, um, so someone's talking about there, have a kindergarten um, kindergartner who has been um, in a virtual setting now. And it looks like she came from Argentina. So I'm trying to read through the, all of this, sorry. Um, and, you know, so my wife and I are retired educators and we're trying to get her interacting with us and she is bored in school sometimes. Um, so I think some of the things that Munir was talking about, you know, bingo and those sorts of things, seems like they, that might be a good um, answer for that one. Um, but I also appreciate the, the comments here. I'm grateful that I don't have to teach now. I salute you um, all for your dedication. So it's a nice thing to hear. Let's see, any other questions? Another comment in here, parents are often very stressed trying to work from home. They don't have the time energy to spend more time in the evening logging into school platforms. I do think that's a, a general challenge is that, you know, educators are facing this. How do I, you know, reach all these kids in this new format? But teachers are also, I mean, parents are also trying to figure out how do I work in my own job now in a, in a remote environment? It's just a, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unknowns, a lot of newness for sure. Any other questions you want to put into the chat? If not, then I thank you for your time. I think I will turn it back over to Brett who can share a little bit more about some of the future lectures that are coming up from the Van Andel Institute. Are you on mute, Brett? There we go, there we go, off mute. <laughs> Thanks so much everybody for joining us today. And thank you uh, particularly for the panelists for your time and efforts and uh, bringing through your perspectives. Uh, and also for uh, taking the polls from your students and that sort of thing to engage them in our lecture today as well. So we're thankful for the time and effort that you've put into not only this, but also for the time, effort, and energy that you put into uh, your classrooms. Our students around the nation are fortunate to have educators like you working with them. Uh, so Tara, thank you to you and the span, uh, speakers for today's insight and conversation. And thanks again to each one of you for taking time out of your day to join us to learn more about uh, the dedication and power and knowledge that educators are continuing uh, to adapt to best serve our students in their communities. And we thank you for your uh, own personal commitment to continued learning and engagement. Uh, to help you stay active and engaged with all the great work happening at the Institute, you can visit VAI.org. Uh, you can sign up for our mailing list there. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, and you can look for all of the 2021 public lecture events that we've got coming up. We'll be getting those dates out to you in early January. Uh, the Institute's groundbreaking work certainly continues no matter what the circumstances, just like education happens no matter what the circumstances. Uh, and all of these are great avenues for learning about the latest in education initiatives as well as the research initiatives uh, and the many science-centered events that happen at the Institute throughout the year. So, to each and every one of you, happy holidays. Thank you for joining us and best wishes into 2021. Have a great day.